Okay, good afternoon everyone. It is 3 o'clock and uh, we would like to start the webinar promptly. So, welcome everyone to today's session of, oh, sorry, John, should I ask you to record now? We're already recording. Awesome. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone, and good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining uh, today's informational webinar on the RQL 4922 Stakeholder Services Tool. Um, it's been a long time coming, and we're here. I'm very excited to share an overview and answer any questions that you have. Um, and we do have a packed agenda, and we would like to reserve a good 25, 30 minute portion for the Q and A. So we would just like to get right to it and um, and begin the the presentation promptly. Um, so with that, we'll just start. Uh, John, next next slide, please. So, of course, we'd like to always start with a, an, an icebreaker and we would like you guys to take the opportunity if you wouldn't mind and just use the chat feature uh, to allow us to get you know, to know you a little better. So, if you wouldn't mind, including uh, what's asked on the screen, your name, pronouns, affiliation, um, and a fun question. What is you know, 1 area of expertise that you are most proud of? And we'll give you a couple of minutes for that. I'll just note for those that aren't familiar with using WebEx, the uh, oh. the little looks like a thought bubble on the bottom right. Uh, it's where you can click on that and enter your information. Thank you, Michael. I think that was on the next slide with the WebEx instructions, but yes, that's very helpful. Oh, welcome, Cameron from Block Power. Thank you for joining. Ken, we spoke this morning, my friend. Thank you so much for joining. Good afternoon, Daniel. Awesome. Hi, Haley, Yasmin. Teresa, thank you, everyone. This is great. Continue, please, putting your information in the chat, and um, and we'll proceed to the next slide, please. <clears throat> so, just a little overview, as Michael had already um, brought to your attention. So, we are using WebEx. We do have a new WebEx assistant feature that we'd like to share with everyone. So, as Michael said, if you look at the bottom of your screen, you will see, you know, all the mute video, your share buttons, your participant in chat. Uh, on the lower right hand will be your chat. Um, feature that you can open. Um, we also have to the left, uh, which is uh, a new WebEx feature. We now have the ability to show closed captions. So you as the attendee can opt to select that if you would like to see everything that is being um, presented today in, in uh, real time. I will note that at this point, WebEx can only um, translate in English. Um, but we're very excited to have this feature and uh, we trust that you guys will enjoy it as well. We also want to let you know <clears throat> that we will be taking questions. Um, towards the end, but you can ask questions at any time throughout the presentation. If it's a verbal question, um, we just ask that you kind of pull that off towards the designated Q and A portion so that we can allow the flow of the presentation to proceed. But feel free to use the chat um, questions as well as the Q and A, and we will do our best to answer every question. And those that we can't, we will follow up and and report back on on the frequently asked questions that will be posted on my service solicitation page. Okay. Next slide, please. So I think I'll, I'm picking up from here. Um, it's great to be with you here today. Uh, my name is Michael Duramio, uh, the assistant director for energy and climate equity here at NYSERDA. Um, this is an important 
uh, step for an ICERTA. We really see it as a milestone in our organization and our work with communities. Um, it's based on what we've heard from, I'm sure, many of you on the line and, and others around the need to recognize uh, and pay for the time and contributions uh, of those with the expertise and experience in uh, that we need here, on, honestly, at NYSERDA in order to do our work of advancing an inclusive clean energy economy. That, in particular, development of clean energy programs that um, meet the needs of and benefit historically marginalized communities. So, um, uh, you've uh, Lisa is, is also part of our team here, the Energy and Climate Equity team. We are together. We are one of the two official. We are both the uh, official points of contact for this solicitation. So, if you do have any questions, you should those should be directed to us um, or to the email that we'll provide. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, so today we plan to give uh, um, those considering applying to join this this opportunity. Uh, an overview of the purpose of this uh, contractor pool that we're establishing, including who is eligible, what types of services we are seeking here at NYSERDA. Um, we'll also provide some tips for how you can apply um, and provide a strong proposal, um, how proposals will be measured and by whom, as well as a timeline for when you, we can expect to uh, have contracts in place that will be able to then work with those that are in the uh, that are eligible and, and qualified for the pool of uh, service providers. Um, we're like Lisa mentioned, we're going to reserve we've reserved as much time as needed for answering any questions that you have. So please do enter those uh, along the way, um, and we'll organize those and do our best to respond to them. Um, but before getting started, so along those lines, actually, uh, and before getting started with the content, I think Lisa is going to talk about some of our guidelines for our time together. Yes, thanks, Michael. Next slide, please, John. So just some basic community agreements we like to go over prior to any of our um, webinars. Um, basically, you know, one mic, please stay on mute unless you are speaking. Uh, use the practice of three before me. Wait until at least three other people talk or before speaking again, just to make space for everyone to be heard. Um, Want to confirm that this this webinar will be recorded and will be made available uh, after the webinar, and it will be posted on NYSERDA's solicitation page along with all the other attached documents. Um, so that's where you'll find that. And again, I wanted to reiterate, you know, this is we, we try to set this up so that you can participate at your comfort level. So we've, we've arranged for you to contribute in various ways. So again, you can use the question and answer feature, which is only visible to the panelists, if that's what you prefer. You can use the chat feature, which is, you know, um, everyone would be able to see that. Um, or you can verbally raise your hand. We just, again, um, just as a, uh, helping us to stay on track, it, we would prefer if you would uh, save your verbal questions towards the end of the designated Q&A portion. And with that, we'll go on to the next slide. I'm going to pick it right back up, pick the mic back up from Lisa. So, um, the purpose, uh, you know, comes that they were hoping you all uh, on the line here get out of the webinar today is that you walk away informed uh, about the RFQL that we're talking about here. Um, there was a previous uh, request for information webinar on the same uh, topic where we released a draft of this RFQL um, and got a a, a lot of comments back and we've done our best to address and incorporate as much as we could. And we provided a Q and a document on the. The RFQL announcement, um, so if you're interested to see what we feedback, we got that's there. Um, but this is, this is the, the actual RFQL, whereas that was a. We were asking for information from from uh, the communities to inform the development of this RFQL. This is now the final RFQL that's now out for. Proposals, we're soliciting proposals to it. Um, we're going to provide some use cases for how uh, various communities, uh, community-based organizations in particular, uh, will be contracted, will be qualified, and then contracted in the, the group or what we call a pool. Um, we're going to clarify the application process for you. We hope to make it that as simple as possible. We know it can be 
Mercedes uh, process can always be improved and we're doing our best to make it as simple as possible for you. Um, while adhering to our uh, state procurement guidelines. And then finally, we're going to share guidance for how to prepare a strong application. So, um, with that, if we could go to the next slide. Um, so, before, before we get into a bit more of an overview of what is in actually in the RFQL, I wanted to take a few moments to um, talk about why, why we're doing this, this pool, putting this solicitation together like this. This is, is a different type of solicitation than ICERTA has done before. So we're really excited and want to give you a bit more context on how this has come about. Um, so the um, next slide, please. So I'm sorry, then the next one beyond that. So uh, some of you may be familiar that in 2019, uh, the state of New York uh, passed and was signed into law, the uh, Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. This was a historic uh, piece of legislation that really has set the bar, uh, we, we believe really for the country and where we need to go uh, to address climate, uh, climate disruption and, and the crisis that we exist in and that we're feeling already, especially during the summer months like this with extreme heat, et cetera. So looking at reducing our emissions, but also importantly, uh, mandating that at least 35% of the benefits from all of the investment we need to, to make in order to get to a net zero or carbon neutral, meaning no net uh, more carbon emissions are put up into the atmosphere, um, that 35% of all that investment that's gonna be needed to go there um, with a goal of 40% uh, is directed to disadvantaged communities. And while there is an interim definition of how we define disadvantaged communities, and there's a, a link there that you can look on this slide here, you can look uh, to see what that means and type in your address and see if, uh, or a particular address to see if it's in, in the current interim definition. We do expect a final definition to be, uh, well, finalized by the end of the year, um, which is subject though to the Climate Justice Working Group uh, which is a group of climate justice community-based organizations that have developed uh, a new proposed definition. Um, uh, however, I do enc encourage those that haven't already to submit comments on that definition, which the comment period closes on August 5th. You can find out more about that at that link. Um, so at the same time, uh, we're also developing a framework for measuring, tracking, and reporting benefits to communities. Um, in accordance with the requirements of the, the Climate Act. Um, and we, we anticipate similarly that this will be wrapped up later this year. We'll be able to communicate about that more, more publicly. But as we do this defining work and uh, measuring work that, that these, uh, those efforts are, are focused on, NYSERDA, you know, really recognizes, if we go to the next slide, um, just we recognize that uh, and it, we acknowledge that the, the role that public policy has played in perpetuating many of the inequities that those communities that have been identified face on a daily basis. They live it on a daily basis. Um, so we, we are working to address some of those inequities. And that's really what, uh, what we're talking about today is a step in that direction, um, which I believe starts with that acknowledgement of what needs to change and the role that we can play here in ICERTA uh, to move that forward. The next slide, please. Um, so, you know, uh, to, you know, NYSERDA knows that to achieve our goals here, we need to center the experiences and expertise of disadvantaged communities, frontline communities, environmental justice communities, uh, in the solutions, in the develop identification of the needs and the development of the solutions. So to address that need, NYSERDA is, is really working more broadly. Uh, and across the authority to make that this more possible to to make accessing and working with communities here at NYSERDA more regular course of business uh, in a deeper way. And a cornerstone of that of that strategy, if we can go to the next slide, is compensating stakeholders uh, for 
their time and their expertise, their contributions to help us uh, here at NYSERDA ensure that we're developing programs that meet the needs of diverse communities across the state. Um, so with that, I am going to uh, turn it back to, I believe, Lisa to take it from here. Lisa, I'm not sure if you're on mute, but can't hear you. Hi, thanks, Michael. I did want to do a sound check. I know there was some chat that my volume was low, so am I okay? Awesome. Thank you. Um, so, yes, yeah, so if we can go to the next slide, John, please. So, <clears throat> the purpose of this um, disadvantaged community stakeholder pool, um, as stated here, is mm -hmm. to establish a group of the qualified community based organizations that represent the disadvantaged communities. Um, to work with NYSERDA. Yeah. And we believe that having this organization, having these organizations already pre qualified in a pool is going to already qualified in the pool will compensate organizations easy and efficient. So here's some of the um, important information that you need to know about the pool. The contracts will remain in the pool for four years. So you apply to the pool now. And, and the um, umbrella contract will go through 2026. After qualifying and accepting the agreement to join the pool, the organizations will be contracted through NYSERDA by program teams through a task work order. And those task work orders will be for specific information, such as consultation, giving input on programs, basically all the service area categories that we've outlined in the solicitation. Each task order will be specific in the work scope the timeline and the pay, and the activities will vary. I want you to know also that this is the first round of the pool. So if for whatever reason you may not uh, get a chance to apply or get selected for this round, we do intend to have recurring rounds um, about six month intervals, depending the amount of um, proposals that we receive. Next slide, please. Oh, so I'm so excited to talk about this. So, as Michael alluded to earlier, we did conduct um, a request for information and we'd like to share with you. Uh, we'd like to report back with you the extent of the feedback that we've gotten um, and the efforts that we really made, as he said, to incorporate the feedback that we're seeking to make to make this solicitation and future working opportunities with NYSERDA teams um, easier, remove barriers or, or reduce them as much as we can. Um, so, if you go to the next slide, please, John. So <clears throat> you can read this slide. I wanted to give you some context. So as Michael alluded to, um, back in March, we conducted a request for information, um, which is our public comment period. That was at the advice of our uh, leadership team, and uh, we had done extensive uh, stakeholder engagement prior to that. Back in November, we had some co-visioning sessions with environmental and climate justice organizations, where we asked very specific questions about compensation. Um, and just getting thoughts. Um, some of the questions uh, that we asked were, are NYSERDA's RFPs accessible? We asked questions about compensation for stakeholders and any thoughts on who the contractor pool should be open to. We asked about terminology and descriptive language and what we should consider um, for the types of participation, what kind of language uh, we should consider using for the types of participation of these frontline communities that we're trying to um, attract. Uh, we asked how NYSERDA contracts could be made more accessible and work for the community organizations that we're trying to attract. We also asked what kind of resources are essential to supporting this kind of energy equity planning work besides compensation. Um, we received such valuable feedback from that session. So those were two, two different sessions we had. We also had one-on-ones with various organizations, um, and that all culminated into this request for information that we did in March. And then that request for information, which was held for about a three-week period, uh, we also asked very pointed uh, questions about the compensation mechanisms we're proposing. Um, if For those of you who were uh, involved in that, if you recall, we had the, the RFQL, which we shared in its full transparency. Um, so that we can get the feedback so that you can see what we're planning on putting out and giving us feedback to make it better. And boy, did you do that? You really stepped up and the comments that we received 
in my opinion, just really made the RFQL that much better. So in front of you on the screen is an example of just one comment that we've gotten. And based on that, we were able to um, modify our CBO definition to account for that, to make it clear that <coughs> CBOs are not required to be incorporated. Uh, John, would you go to the next slide, please? Another comment we heard, how, how great it was to see lived experience. And for that, we thank you because We've learned from you and we've learned from all the feedback that we've gotten um, that lived experience is an important part of reaching out to these frontline communities and incorporating those different perspectives. Um, so based on that, we will, and we also, uh, somebody also suggested um, that we include a point scale to, for transparency to help, you know, new organizations, not just those who have typically done work with NYSERDA, but new organizations who've not done work. Um, so basically, we agreed, and based on that, we included a very simple table format where it, it lots the points very clearly so that as you're preparing for your proposal, you can see what areas, um, I mean, all areas, should, you should apply, you know, uh, all your effort in all areas, but you'll see the breakdown of points. Um, so those are just two examples, and as Michael said, we also included the original request for information, um, all public comments that we received, NYSERDA's responses to those comments, and we went a step further and included a column as to why or why not we included that, that comment. Um, and I would share with you that uh, I chose to share all the comments verbatim. So what you see is, is exactly how they came in. We chose not to summarize them. Um, and I did that because I think it's important that we reflect all of the voices and um, the perspectives that people brought. Um, so I, I, I hope you appreciate that and I hope you gather uh, rich intel from that. I, I would say it's not something that we you know, could potentially keep do. This was a small, uh, small number of, of stakeholders that responded. So you can imagine if we have a, uh, an RFI that has 200 or so comments, that would be a little bit more difficult to do. But for this, um, and because everyone was so patient with the release of this RFQL, that's what we decided to do. So with that, we'll go on to the next slide, please. Um, so here was just a nice snapshot that I wanted to, and I want to acknowledge publicly, we understand that there was some, um, there was some confusion with some of the links that went out in our communications. Um, those were all vetted and checked prior to them going out. So I, we apologize for that. Um, and so as a result, we want to direct people and let everyone know that please go to my sort of solicitation page as shown here. Um, so you could go to, you know, my service funding opportunities page, and then you look for the disadvantaged community stakeholder RQL pool. You click on that, it's going to bring you to this longer description. And underneath that description, you're going to see the application submission process as well as all of the associated documents that we're talking about today. Um, so if you if you've received any correspondence that had a broken link, I just want to encourage people to come to our nice sort of web page. This will be the most up-to-date and um uh this should be the safe harbor that you come to to get all the most up to date information, including any changes going forward as a result of this, a change of summary. These will all be posted on the associated docs page. So please um, come to this page for all the up to date, latest and greatest information. Next slide, please. Okay, service area categories. Next slide, John. So the service area categories um, are, are basically just the areas of expertise uh, that we're seeking in each of the service areas. Um, I do I do acknowledge that there was some confusion with that term um, that we received from the request for information, um, and it appeared that some people thought the service areas were geographical areas. So again, apologies for that. Um, the service area actually speaks to the areas of expertise that we're looking for the, in these individual areas. So these are the five areas that we're seeking. Advisor, policy and program co-design, uh, public engagement, community capacity building and meeting facilitation, inclusive program outreach and marketing to disadvantaged communities, and finally, community assessment. Next slide, please. So these are just some examples of, uh, and again, this is all from the RQL. Um, so these are just some examples of what the advisory capacity would look like. This would be someone um, who would serve as a consultant, a subject matter expert, a steering committee or a working group, participate in stakeholder meetings and more sector specific and long term engagements with NYSERDA teams, 
um, or consult community members and report back on findings and make recommendations to NYSERDA. I do wanna make a distinction here. It is important to note the pool was set up. Um, I think the trigger word here for me is long-term engagements. So when you think of the pool, these are anywhere from maybe, you know, it could be a short-term three-month engagement to a long-term engagement. But that's why we're trying to establish the pool to have these retained resources already in place so that when program teams come with their needs, we have a pool of experts in each service area that can that can help with that with that request. Next slide, please. Policy and program design. This is a huge one, and uh, we're very excited about it. And you'll hear from a colleague later on in the presentation, um, speaking. Uh, presenting a use case as a sample of what this could look like. But in this in this service area, this is um, these are the, you know, the collaborative design processes that we're hearing uh, that program teams would like to see in the, you know, transportation, uh, clean energy, uh, building electrification. Um, this would be a pool where you would collaborate with NYSERDA to develop a list of knowledge gaps, uh, deliver presentations on areas of, of experience, provide feedback, um, principles for engagement in disadvantaged communities. And the last bullet I think is an important one because again, this is as a result of the feedback that we heard, um, especially the question about NYSERDA nice sort of RFPs not being accessible. So we've included this as a service area where um, a potential task work order could be uh, supporting NYSERDA nice sort of teams in reviewing uh, potential draft solicitations uh, and other requests, other public documents before they're going out so that it reflects and that we're speaking at, at the level that is effective, that people can understand, and that would encourage people to want to apply. Um, a note here that if uh, if this service area is used, whoever is working on that task order would not be able to apply to that solicitation or whatever public document that we're presenting uh, just as a matter of my sort of policy. So just want to uh, just want to state that explicitly. Next slide, please. These are just other examples of what uh, this service area can look like. Analyzing and reporting back, providing culturally competent translation and interpretation services. Again, we're thinking at the local level. Um, so we want to make available and we really have come up with what we think are very broad um, and helpful areas that are going to help inform uh, NYSERDA program teams as we continue working with disadvantaged communities um, and, and meet our climate goals. Next slide, please. And this is another area where um, inclusive program outreach is huge. Um, we, we would like to have the ability to tap into expertise on what best channels uh, we should be using for our communications. We realize that our list serves are, are not the only way and um, and we can do a much better job of promoting our, our information more broadly and conducting more on the ground um, engagement for culturally competent type of um, messaging that we want to be incorporating in our communications. Next slide, please. And this one, community assessment. So this this was a, a very um, interesting service area because we have other teams, such as our marketing and, and characterization team, that already have um, they have a pool of of, of their own uh, professional evaluators. Um, but there might be potential in the future for that team to want to tap into some of these disadvantaged communities. Um, and conduct a community assessment. And that can be, you know, a, an example of that could be partnering with local educational institutions to conduct community-based participatory research, assisting in data collection and reporting. I also wanna highlight that we really uh, were intentional about setting up this pool so that we can be flexible with other current streams of opportunity at NYSERDA. Um, so uh, we know that this, uh, the marketing pool has, a, has, a, has some um, specific experts so this school may not necessarily need to be experts in the research and analytical skills, but we would like to partner with these researchers to the extent that we can to provide the resources and information to make better info, better choices, um, better informed choices to our program design. So you know we're not looking for like professional evaluators, but this is a this is a service area that I would encourage anyone who's interested to read more thoroughly about in the description of the uh, the solicitation. Next slide, please. 
And with that, I would like to introduce my colleague, Sarah Jayanthi, who is going to uh, present on a use case of the New York Sun community led co design. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Lisa. Um, can, can you hear me? Loud and clear. Okay, great. So, my name is Sarah Jayanthi. I'm a project manager on the New York Sun team. Um, and I'm excited to talk today about one of the opportunities that will be offered under the RFQL a co design effort to build a program that supports the development of a community led or community owned solar in underserved communities. I know that was a mouthful, so I'll just say it again. Um, it will be a co design effort to build a program that supports the development of community led or community owned solar in underserved communities. Oh, next slide. I'm sorry. I just realized my slide isn't on the screen. I don't see the slides moving. Is that just me? Uh, I see the slide up here, Sarah. Okay, great. It must be my internet is being slow. Um, so the co-design will run six to nine months with the goal to create a program that supports community developed solar projects in New York state. Uh, co-design participants will work closely with NYSERDA over the six to nine months, identifying barriers that are currently impeding community led solar development in the state and helping NYSERDA develop a list of possible solutions to identify those barriers. Stakeholders interested in participating in the co-design must first apply and be accepted into the RFQL pool. Uh, once selected for the stakeholder services pool, NYSERDA will issue a mini bid that participants can apply to in order to participate in the co-design. If participants are selected for an award under the co-design mini bid, then participants will be issued a task work order and compensated for their time. Uh, further questions related to the community solar co-design mini bid will be addressed at a later date uh, after the RFQL pool is established and after NYSERDA issues the mini bid. Um, NYSERDA will hold a separate webinar for questions specifically related to the community solar co-design mini bid. Um, I know that that was a lot. Uh, what we're just trying to say here is that this will be one of the opportunities offered under the RFQL and that in order to participate in this co-design, stakeholders must first apply and be accepted to this RFQL pool. So with that, next slide, please. And it's moving slowly on my end. So Michael, is the slide up? Yes, it is. <laughs> All right, great. Um, so now I wanna take a minute and walk through what the co-design will look like so you have a better sense of the opportunity. Um, and I'd like to caveat that this schedule might change. We just wanted to give you a sense of what the co-design would look like. Um, so after selecting participants for the co-design, we will hold a kickoff of a kickoff meeting where all the participants can meet each other, walk through the detailed schedule, and what I think is the most important activity in the session, we will collectively decide on what community agreements and consents and the consensus process for decision making. Um, the next phase of the co-design will be trainings. Uh, we anticipate that many of the selected co-design participants will have varying levels of expertise on how solar development uh, works in New York State. So we will be conducting trainings on relevant topics so that all participants can enter the next phases, which are issue identification and solution development with equal levels of understanding. Um, so several of the topics that we're planning for the trainings include how solar is financed, how solar is cited, how interconnection works, and we will leave two slots open for co-design participants to tell us what the topics they wanna learn to inform them on the next phase of the co-design. And after that, we dive right into the issue identification piece. Um, the objective here is to really explore, understand, and summarize the issues that are impeding the development of community-led and community-owned solar in New York right now. Next slide, please. All right, I'm gonna assume it's on there. It is, it is. Great. Um, after the issue identification phase, we're gonna move on to solution development. So that phase of the co-design, uh, we co-design participants in NYSERDA will collaborate on identifying what potential solutions there are for the issues that came up during issue identification. 
So in this phase, the co-design participants and NYSERDA will also work together to draft a brief that contains proposals on how to support community-led and community-owned solar in New York State. So for phase two of the solution development phase, we'll actually share that brief with the public and gather input and feedback through NYSERDA's RFI process. So if an entity for whatever reason is not participating in the co-design, there's still an opportunity for them to review and provide feedback on selected solutions. So the final phase of this is program development and release where NYSERDA will take the solutions brief and the comments and feedback of the RFI process and we'll develop the final program. Um, and so with that, I will hand it back to Lisa. We just wanted to give everybody an idea of the type of opportunity that's offered under this RFQL. So this is one example of many uh, exciting things that will be under the RFQL. Thanks for the time, Lisa, and I'll hand it back to you. Thanks so much, Sarah. Just do want to do a check. Is my audio okay? Yep, I can hear you, Lisa. Okay, thank you. Okay, so let's um, next slide, please. So applying to RFQL, how do we do it? Next slide, please. So this is a very big and important topic, and I want to do it its due diligence as we received many inquiries about this. All proposers, regardless of the service area categories you are applying to, must, must demonstrate that they meet the eligibility criteria and possess the following qualifications as seen right in front of you. Be a New York State community-based organization uh, based on the definition that we have in our um, RFQL. This includes grassroots advocacy, faith-based coalitions, service providers, and indigenous nations based in and or serving disadvantaged communities um, as defined by the Climate Justice Working Group and the disadvantaged map that we have. The person must have, or the organization, I should say, should have expertise, including lived experiences of community members of disadvantaged communities in areas such as energy equity and justice issues, climate change, housing, transportation, or energy-related issues that impact those communities. They must represent and demonstrate accountability to residents of historically marginalized communities. They should have knowledgeable staff or team with relevant experience in one or more service areas. And they should demonstrate the ability to deliver services requested in one or more of the service categories and the flexibility to respond to the services requested. I do want to state also that proposers that have existing contracts with NYSERDA for distinct activities are still eligible to propose to this RFQL. However, no activities included in the proposer's pre-existing contract with NYSERDA will be assigned or compensated under an agreement resulting from this RFQL. Next slide, please. Um, so the proposal requirements uh, are clearly stated um, on page 15 of the solicitation. Again, I would encourage everyone to, to read it uh, quite carefully. Um, so again here, to be eligible for service area categories under this RQL, proposers are invited to submit a complete proposal bid package describing their skills, expertise, qualifications, personnel rates um, in any or all service area categories and agree to the requirements of this RFQL. Let me state explicitly, you do not have to be you do not have to apply to all service areas. You can apply to one, multiple, all of them. You may be selected for one, multiple, or none of them, depending on the qualifications. Um, so again, we encourage you to apply for those uh, service areas where you feel you have the, your organization has the most experience and expertise, but you are not required to apply to all of them. Part of the uh, proposal requirements that we are requesting is a copy of uh, the RRS form 990 for those who are um, 501c3s um, for the current year and the prior two years, uh, or some similar tax and financial documentation if unincorporated or for profit. If you have any questions regarding the type of documentations, please send emails, send an email to the public engagement folder, um, and we would be happy to confirm what would be acceptable 
um, to help you with your preparation for the solicitation package. I, I do want to also um, share with you that this, this is another result of the feedback that we have gotten that we've worked with our internal support teams to make it a uh, to, to have the ability for proposers to submit one proposal or one application to apply to multiple service areas. What we heard is we don't have capacity, we don't have the time, we don't have the resources. You know, don't don't allow don't don't force us to have to choose a new proposal for each service area. So we've heard you, we've worked internally. Um, so not you will not have the option to submit one application. You still have to outline all the areas that you're you know responding to in the RQL, but you're able to submit that once. To help reduce um, to help reduce the amount of time that it would take to complete multiple proposals. So we we hope that the, that that is something that uh, is valuable to you. I also want to reiterate we've we've you know chosen a 15 page maximum. That does not include any additional attachments or, or um, supporting documentation, uh, but you don't don't feel it has to be 15 if it's over 15 that's fine the point here is just to make it concise we don't need a dissertation we just want you to respond to the very detailed information and in the order that we asked it for that is what's going also going to help make for a successful solicit uh, a successful um, proposal next slide please okay let's talk about how proposals will be evaluated so proposals that meet the solicitation requirements will be reviewed by a scoring committee consisting of internal MISERTA staff and scored for each category, A through E of those service area categories that they propose. And we're using the evaluation criteria that's in the um, solicitation where we've also included the, the table, those are the points assigned for each of the components of the evaluation. The minimum threshold is 65 points out of a possible 100 per proposed service area category. Let me repeat that 65. The minimum threshold is 65 points out of 100 possible points per proposed service area. No proposed category with an average score of less than 65 points will be considered for contract negotiations at NYSERDA's discretion. Proposers may be requested to interview with all or part of the scoring committee to address any potential questions or clarifications outlined in the proposals. Proposers will be notified if they are requested to attend an, an interview. However, you should not um, applicants should be clear and complete and not rely on a possible interview for that. So um, if there's doubt, we just encourage you to submit as much as you think would be helpful. Uh, if you have questions, uh, as Michael said, I and him are the first primary contact. So we receive all of the emails through the public engagement folder. We will respond accordingly to help you better prepare for your submission. Next slide, please. Um, so all of the areas of the experience and expertise, revenue status and cost effectiveness, the accountability and representation, those are all the components within the evaluation. Um, so they're just listed here briefly for your reference, but again, the actual solicitation has all of this information in greater detail. This is just an overview to, to, to help you. Um, an important point is um, that proposers may be requested to submit additional information. And I also wanted to bring to your attention that this 3 million um, annual revenue, um, that is a precedent that we took from DEC. Again, we're not gonna disqualify anyone if, if you make over 3 million, but we need we need a baseline because we are trying to prioritize those organizations and CBOs who are under-resourced. Um, so it will, be, it will be on a point system. Um, so that's how we're gonna rate whether you're in or not. It doesn't mean you'll be excluded. It's just your point, you're, we're gonna rate the evaluation based on that threshold will be uh, an, an important part of the evaluation component, but it, it will not necessarily exclude you. Next slide, please. Okay, how to apply. So, very simply, um, again, go to NYSERDA solicitation page. It is hyperlinked here. Um, so, go right to that 4922 uh, DAC stakeholder services. The long description will give you all of the attached documents that you need. Um, the actual solicitation, it's titled summary under the attached documents. That summary doc is the actual solicitation. 
I just want to state that because that can be a little misleading when you see the word summer, you think it's a short, but it's just the actual long solicitation. You will also see the apply online. The apply online feature is the actual portal. You do not have to worry about that until you're ready to submit. However, I would say for those who have used the portal, you would use your, you know, your existing uh, login. But for those who haven't and would like to go in and try to set it up, we encourage you to do that. Anything that we can do in advance to prepare you, because I have gotten some calls from someone who did try to use the portal and wasn't able to uh, use the credentials. So, so anything that we can do in advance to set that up, uh, if you have any problems, again, email me. I will help you rectify those. We just really want to set you up for success as early as possible. And also on that uh, solicitation page, you will see another document that um, is the application instructions and portal training guide. That would be a helpful resource for you as well. Next slide, please. Okay, so here, here's our guidance for preparing and submitting an effective proposal. Um, start early, right? Um, we really have tried to make it um, we really reduce the barriers. We did not require, um, you know, letters of references. You know, we, we do need um, other bios and things like that. But all, all of the required documents that we requested are clearly outlined in the RFQL. We encourage you to please um, start early gather the documents we really want this to be a successful opportunity um so don't wait until the last minute i also want to address there was a comment about someone asking why we can't extend the proposal time cutoff time from three o'clock because people work and, and after hours and very valid questions um we we vetted that um and we just we need a, we need a date we need a time rather we need a time by which also proposals have to be received. There was only one person on our contracts team who was responsible for going through all that and prepping that. So that that is a hard three o'clock stop. So again, you know, allow yourself ample time. Don't worry about the length of the proposal. What's really more important is that you're responding to everything that we've requested in the order that we've requested. Next slide, please. Okay. So now we're going to talk about a timeline and I am very excited to share some really good news with you. So let's go to the next slide. So here, as Michael said, are the milestones that we've reached. The request for qualifications went live and was released on July 14th. We are conducting the informational webinar today, July 27th. The proposals are due. Yay. <laughs> we've extended the proposal due date. Um, so uh, it's been extended from August 17th through September 12th, making the RFQL available um, for eight weeks. We understand people are still on holiday and vacations and back to school. And um, again, we work so hard. We really want to give you the ample time that you need. So uh, that that decision was just made yesterday. We got approval for. So we will be updating our solicitation documents. And but please, I want you to know that I want you to um, receive that. Um, and I hope you're as happy and excited about that as we are and share that with your networks, right? So the proposal due date is no longer August 17th. It is now September 12th. Um, we will then work very, very diligently after that due date of September 12th for the scoring committee, the internal. That was another benefit of having an internal scoring committee because, you know, the dates we would have to um, secure a lot of dates. So this has been a very nimble process. So we are starting with our internal scoring committee. We're going to meet in September. We're going to review proposals. Um, we're going to work towards November to qualify the pool of organizations that are selected and contacted, issue umbrella contracts with each qualified CBO in the October November timeframe, and then hope to have a fully established operational pool in place with task work orders for work beginning in November of 2022. Next slide, please. Wow, we did it. Here we are at the Q&A. So um, that was a lot of information and I'm, my mouth is dry, so I'm gonna stop talking and then just say that um, this is the time where we're gonna welcome all of your questions and answers and uh, help clarify anything further that we haven't already. Again, to submit a comment or question, you can either type it into the chat or the Q&A. You can raise your hand and the facilitator will let you know when um, you're selected to be unmuted and able to speak to the group. Thank you. I guess, Michael, do we have any 
questions? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, so I can, we've been collecting questions coming in from the chat. I just want to encourage people that are more comfortable to raise their hand. Uh, I don't see that. So I'll ask our, my colleagues here that are able to see that if. If you do want to raise your hand, it's a little hand icon in the bottom. Usually, um. You can certainly speak to your question as well, uh, but we've been collecting questions in the chat. So I'm, I'm going to. Take uh, 1 or 2 that are uh, ones that I can. I can speak to um, the 1st question is around clarifying what is considered a disadvantaged community. By NYSERDA, and I should clarify that it's really not just by uh, there's a state. Definition uh, that was developed. Um, there's an interim. Definition that has been developed coming out of the climate act. We are required to have that in place. Um, even as a final definition. That's been developed with the climate justice working group members. Um, is been proposed, but hasn't been finalized. So, there's a comment period I mentioned. Feel free to weigh in on that until August 5th. Um, there's a link on the slides here. Uh, you can find it pretty easily um, on our website. Uh, but in the meantime, we, we have this interim definition, uh, which we are using for this solicitation. Um, so please do use that as your basis. And that's what's on the web, the map that you'll see when you go to the website, which is based on uh, geographies that are located within um, uh, with a high pro proportion of low to moderate income households, as well as uh, opportunity zones. Um, those were the primary uh, criteria, I'm sorry, as well as the, the environmental justice areas uh, designated by the Department of Environmental Conservation. Now, the, the caveat to that is, um, I suppose I should probably go, off, uh, go on video here. The caveat, the caveat to this is this solicitation is not limited to those geographies. Uh, in, 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 in other words, if you, uh, I, I will say, I, before I actually say, I was about to say, clarify that this is targeted to community based organizations. It is not meant for individuals or residents. We have a separate uh, mechanism that we put in place, what we refer to as an honorarium, but it's a opportunity for short term um, compensation for, for example, participation in a meeting. Um, or responding to a, um, a survey, for example, that is available to individuals. This RFQL here is for organizations, both, um, I think, as Lisa noted earlier, unincorporated nonprofits, as well as incorporated nonprofits, 501c3s and, of, and other varieties, um, and as well as unincorporated, so not uh, federally recognized, but still a state recognized, uh, you know, organization. Um, that is mission driven, um, as well as a for profit, but mission driven and disadvantaged community serving, uh, organizations. So those are all qualifying organizations. I think there was a question here about, um, what a, what a school that meets those, uh, that, that serves those communities. If you can meet enough of the criteria in the, the, the evaluation criteria that Lisa mentioned and. Then, then there's no reason uh, that I can think of that um, necessarily, although I, I will say that um, we are not, this opportunity is not open to local government. So in that case, if it is a public, uh, if it is considered part of the local government, uh, that would be a different story. So we are, um, this is intended really to focus on supporting under-resourced, uh, community-based, um, organizations that are based in or or and or uh, principally serve uh, those in those those geographies that have been identified. So your organization doesn't have to be located in with within the designated interim designation uh, for a disadvantaged community, but you principally, in other words, more than 50% of your services and the work that you do should be focused on um, Residents and or other businesses and organizations that are based in those communities um, or other uh, representative um, organization or communities that are considered underserved. So we have, for the purposes of the solicitation, identified disadvantaged communities of is inclusive of hard to reach underserved rural communities, 
indigenous nations and other areas of the state with high levels of poverty and limited access to resources. So as long as you can um, communicate that uh, the work that you do and, and have back it up with some uh, evidence to, to say, suggest that a majority of what you do and who you serve are based in communities that can pretty readily be identified as, as fitting that definition, then uh, um, that, that you should be eligible. Um, but again, that's just one aspect. That's just one aspect of qualifying for the pool. All the other, there's other criteria that Lisa mentioned as well to qualify. Um, just as far as when the, the I'll, I'll further clarify the, the final definition of the, of a disadvantaged community will be developed by the climate justice working group based on uh, the hearings and the public comments that they're getting right now. Um, likely will happen by the end of this year timeframe. Um, so it would potentially apply to any future rounds of this RFQL, but not for the current round. Uh, which will use the interim definition if you're looking to, you know, designate disadvantaged communities. Um, I hope that answered those questions. I think uh, I see the next question. Maybe somebody else wants to take. Unless there's a hand raised, we want to if we want to go back and forth between the hand raising. Hey, Michael, I said that I would take the question that's in the chat for me. So that Lisa has time to review the other ones. Um, so the question that I saw relevant to the you know planned co-design for community owned and community led solar was asking if community solar projects will include energy storage um please clarify if this is the not if this is not exactly the answer you were looking for but you know any however the final program that's going to be designed you know whether that final design or for community owned and community led solar will or will not include energy storage um, that's really the, the very end of the process. What we're asking about here is just, or what we're telling people about here is the fact that we are going to be doing a co-design process um, to figure out, you know, what is the best way to fund community owned and community led solar, including whether or not it should include energy storage. So, um, you know, if that's a topic that's interesting to you and uh, your organization, uh, you know, is eligible for the RFQL, I, I encourage you to apply to the RFQL and, you know, to eventually apply to the mini bid when we release it. So let me know if that answers the question or not. And then Lisa, maybe I'll hand it over to you if you want to answer some of the questions that came in. I apologize, my computer is frozen right now. So if, if someone can take another question. Yeah, like yeah I, can, I can jump in Thank here, Lisa, no, no worries. Um, uh, yeah, so I'd like to go to a hand raise, just wanna bounce back and forth. Um, I think there's a hand raise by Bob Cohen. Bob, do you, if you wanna unmute yourself and ask your question. Bob, if you're talking, I can't hear you. Uh, so just make see if you can unmute yourself. There's a mute button. And if not, um, I think you may have also entered in the chat and I think I can take a stab at answering it. Oh, Bob, I think you're unmuted. Can you try now? Okay, I'm still not hearing anything. Um, but Bob, I think your question, you also typed in the chat here. Um, uh, you have two questions. Um, yes. You're asking about what, what other types of initiatives would feed into this opportunity other than the community solar initiative that, that uh, Sarah just went through. And you say, for example, what initiatives would you be seeking input in the workshops mentioned in the solicitation? Um, and then your second part of your question is a sense of asking for a sense of how receptive we are at NYSERDA for joint proposals by multiple organizations in the same region. Um, I can uh, take a stab at this. Um, so, whoops, things are moving around on me here. Um, yeah, so, um, I, so I think, you know, Lisa went through the, the different types of, of efforts, the community solar is mentioned, basically 
anything we're, we're in the process for of working with the various teams, the program teams at NYSERDA to uh, explore where they have the most um, need and flexibility and ability and, and let's say timing uh, capacity and staffing capacity to work more meaningfully with uh, frontline communities uh, on programs that either directly or indirectly could benefit them. And so that's a process we're going through right now. We have the New York Sun team on here to talk about one particular opportunity, but uh, you could imagine many others. Let's just say that I can't give you other um, specifics at this time, but there are other initiatives that we are talking to various teams about um, across runs, runs the gamut from um, distributed renewables, like the community solar project to large scale renewable development onshore and offshore to uh, transportation and buildings, um, as well as uh, beyond that, uh, things around workforce development and community uh, work with communities and local government, for example, and things of that nature. So there's many possibilities that we are talking about right now. We're obviously gonna need to, you know, be thoughtful about where we focus and where the best opportunity. We, our focus is on finding opportunities where there's flexibility and and ability of our various teams to um, open up uh, thinking about a program um, and want and having the, the timing, the ability because this stuff this does take time, right? To work with uh, community organizations to then survey or engage various communities and. Have a, we generally have a, you know, a process where there's multiple rounds and we want to make sure we're hitting the mark, et cetera. Which, like, like the New York sun example is really like, a, you know, a year long process planning. Um, so, we're trying to be very thoughtful about that sort of project as well as let, let's say less involved opportunities. Uh, with various program teams and or getting specific input on uh, maybe programs that are already developed. So, it's going it, to, there's a really a, a wide range, which will mean a wide range of. Of um, what that work with the the organizations contracted through this through this pool would look like. Um, so I hope that helps some. Uh, and as far as joint proposals, I think it's stated in the the RFQL that you can come in with other organizations named as partners in in your proposal. Those those generally. Uh, um, can't should be named, but there is the flexibility as well down the line. Um, as long as they don't make up a certain, uh, off the top of my head, I'm not, at least you might need to jump in here, but, uh, as long as they're only a certain fraction or a percentage of, of the work that could be added at a later point. So, I hope that answered that question. Um. I, see, I do see another question here that has my name on it. I'll jump to it. Um, there's a question around who to talk to regarding communities labeled as opportunity zones that aren't actually included on the map. Um, so Tracy is the one that submitted this question. Tracy, I would uh, ask you to maybe send more information to the email that's listed at the very end of this presentation or contact uh, Lisa or me uh, with that information and we can make sure it gets to the right uh, people here that are managing that, the current interim definition map, which is what I'm assuming you're referring to. Lisa, are you back online and uh, you wanna take another question here or do you want us to keep going? Yes. Thank you, Michael. I was actually gonna start typing in the chat just as a follow-up to that earlier. Um, comment about the teaming arrangements, um, I was just going to put in the chat that, yeah, the RQL speaks explicitly about teaming arrangements um, on pages 13 and 14, um, and you are correct. We have in here that uh, proposers are permitted but not required to team with partners or subcontractors they consider would offer complementary services and or expertise in the proposing category. Within the budget, overhead fees for subcontractors shall not exceed 2%. Um, and then during the mini, we also made allowances, as you said, that uh, during the mini bid process, an awardee may propose uh, may propose teaming with a subcontract, but 
that was not part of the original initial bid. Um, during the mini bid process, an awardee may propose teaming with a subcontractor that was one, not part of the initial bid, and two, not also qualified by the RFQL as long as the portion of the subcontractor's work is less than 30% of the total task work order value. So that's a lot of information, but again, it's all in the solicitation and we're happy to um, continue taking clarifying questions via our public engagement email box in the future if that's not clear. And I would like to um, take a question um, from uh, Ms. Shirley Hamilton that I see um, has asked, is the RQL just for community-based organizations? Um, and yes, Ms. Hamilton, this uh, request for qualifications is specifically for community-based organizations, um, you know, such as grassroots, advocacy, faith-based, um, and, uh, and others as, as specified on page 11 of the RQL. I also want to uh, respond to Andrew's question, Andrew Isaacs, assuming the slide deck will be posted on the website. Um, yes, we can make that available. Ms. Tabitha Lawrence asks a question, is there an age requirement? No, there is not. Lisa, there's a question um, two, two up from where I think you are right oh, now around uh, fiscal sponsors from Lauren. Okay, can or can you can, I could take this if you want. Yes, thank you. I would appreciate yeah. that. Um, yes, yeah, so, uh, an organization, uh, this relates to the teaming. I think what Lisa was speaking to, to uh, partnering is, is absolutely okay. Um, what really matters is being able to, again, meet the different criteria that we have in the solicitation. Um, we definitely want to make uh, avenues for organizations that may not even be incorpor uh, incorporated to that, but that can demonstrate that they do, in fact, uh, represent, have accountability to, uh, and some uh, ongoing communication with uh, disadvantaged communities, and so or underserved, otherwise underserved communities, as we've defined before. So. Uh, if to the extent that can be done and an organization needs a fiscal sponsor to do that, 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 that should be allowable. Um, but I'll trust, uh, others to correct me. Lisa, while you're reading, I can take a couple of questions. Um, so, first of all, there's a question from, from John Bay who says, what is the game plan if a DAC requires more than five megawatts for distribution? I, actually, John, I'd love for you to clarify that question. Um, you know, I, I think this is related to the community solar, the, the, you know, the co-design of community solar, but, you know, if you can provide more clarity, that would be really helpful. Um, and then from H Davis, uh, what is the minimum, what is the threshold or minimum load capacity for community solar? And then for community solar, is there a minimum number of customers that must be part of the program? Um, I'm assuming or if these are questions specifically about the community solar programs at NYSERDA, I can actually, I'll send you an email with, with information about community solar incentives. But if this is about um, the co-design, um, like if there's a minimum number of cus of people that can participate in the co-design, uh, that will be something that will come out through the mini bid. So um, when the mini bid is released, we'll have information about, you know, like eligibility application who can participate um and that will just be part of the mini bid so uh if you can clarify your question that would be helpful thank you
Okay, maybe we can go to another hand raise. Looks like uh, Elizabeth McCorvey. Do you want to unmute yourself? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, please. Okay, um, I looked at the grant and it said to leave the rates blank. We, what, what do we do? Do we leave the rates blank? And we are not for profit in Westchester County. How do we know that? Well, first of all, we do serve disadvantaged clients, but how do we know that? Is there a map that says a disadvantaged community? And thirdly, when you say community solar, does that mean that are you guys bringing us all to the table to say um, what we would like to see who gets solar where um, in specific areas? And how will y'all enforce that um, you have a uh, ratio, uh, satisfactory ratio of minority contractors. I'm not talking about just just women that are white. It's not fair. So I want to make sure that you know other minorities are true. Uh, other minorities are represented too here with NYSERDA, because we is it's a known fact that brown. Brown and black colored people are often overlooked when it comes to solar and a lot of other clean energy projects. So I appreciate your help with this. Hello. Hi. Several yes. <laughs> So ahead, sorry, Lisa. Michael. I'm so sorry. I was just going to ask you, you. You shared a lot of information, so thank you. And if we can start, if you can repeat one of your first questions so that we can um, start addressing. I want to acknowledge that we've heard everything you said. Just trying to synthesize, unpack it a little bit. Can you repeat one you of your? Want me to repeat my first? Yeah. Question? Yes, please. Okay. Um, I want to know, I'm concerned. I, I looked through the grant and I attempted to try to apply for it. We are a minority founded, uh, not for profit, uh, based in Peekskill, New York. And so it asked for rates, but I see that you guys want, I guess, to know what the organization's budget is because it's capped at 3 million. That's the first thing I'd like to know. What are we supposed to put when it comes to your rates? I was told that we should leave it blank and you would tell us because you 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 select you select the organizations and then I guess you tell us the rates that you're gonna pay. That's the very first question. And then the second question is um how will you guarantee that the bids and stuff and who selected goes to to minorities other than white women or white women fronting as their husbands to get everything over other minority and the black and brown community. Um, it, it's no secret that this has been a problem in clean energy. So, um, when we apply, we want to make sure that we have a fair opportunity. Um, and then the third question is, um, I'm just really concerned about your rates going back again. What, what should we put? You capped it at 3 million. Our budget is way below that. We're about around the $500,000 range. And we've been in the community for th uh, 35 years plus, so we would like to think that we do know something and housing over 50 people of different races um, that we know something about trying to make things more energy efficient, although we've never really gotten anything from NYSERDA. And we'd like to see that change because it's not fair um, that a particular group that's considered minority gets over the black and brown community. We're here and we want to be heard in some of this funding too. Yeah. 
I appreciate the question, um, Elizabeth. Um, just in the interest of time, uh, maybe we can take a stab at responding. Lisa, did you want to take a? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Thanks, Elizabeth. So, um, I just I, first of all, I, I thank you for sharing what you have. Um, I hear you, and I would like to answer questions uh, to the extent that I can. So, I want to be clear. Um, I, I I don't know who told you. Um, to leave rates blank. So, um, Elizabeth, if, and we can we can continue this conversation offline as well. I just I just want to direct you. If you look at the actual solicitation, um, there is a there is a personnel sheet. There is a sheet a budget form that we are asking you to complete, um, and those rates will be based on what you uh, on what you reflect for your for, for the type of work that you have. So that that is a requirement. We would not expect you to leave that blank. Um, so we need you to submit that with your with your financials. And then that'll be part if you make it into the pool and a task work order is assigned, um, that negotiation is going to be based on the rates that you submitted. Does that make sense? Just yeah, just in the interest okay. of time, Lisa, I think we should um, keep probably keep keep moving forward and answering questions here because okay. we have quite a few. Okay. Um, I would like to take um, uh, and Elizabeth, please feel free to email me uh, offline. We, we would like to, you know, I, I definitely want to answer your 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 questions. Um, Kevin Miller, I see, has a question here. What is the range of reimbursement per hour? Uh, again, Mr. Miller, that's going to be based on the rates that you propose based on your organization. Um, that would be part of the the bid package that you select, um, and then when and if you are selected into pool and a test work order is signed. Um, those rates will be negotiated at that time based on what you originally submitted. Um, I would like to continue with Daniel Chu. Is there a cap on the number of CBOs on this pool? Not at this time, Daniel. We have not instituted a cap. However, we reserve the right to do so in the future, depending on uh, the number of, um, you know, the number of uh, organizations we have in each ser service area. But in this initial launch of this, we are keeping it as open, as flexible as possible. So we have not in included any cap at this time. Are there any other questions I have? I see there's a question here, Sarah, that might be more applicable to you. It's from Twiggy Hamilton, uh, and it's regarding a solar solar developer question. Um, it's number 20. Thank you. Thank you for the number, Lisa. <laughs> Can solar developers apply to do this work or just nonprofits? Um, so I think actually, Lisa, this is an eligibility question. So I think the key here, Twiggy, is to look at the eligibility criteria of the RFQL. Um, and if your organization qualifies, then apply away. Thanks, Sarah. I should have noted that. No worries. Michael, there's a question here, number two, 22, that I'd like you to address if, if you would. Uh, okay, so the question is, are CBOs restricted in any way in their use of reimbursements? Um, that's a broad question that's hard to direct directly uh answer i mean uh yes there there are some restrictions um the, and the bottom line is the the compensation in this rfql will be based upon an agreement with a specific team here at nicerta that has a specific need uh so that could entail getting input from residents where you're there's an agreement to provide some form of reimbursement that could be a gift card or what have you to residents. That's just one example. So um, the nature of how the how what kind of funding and around what can be done is really going to be determined around each individual uh, opportunity and based on what each the particular team 
is looking for and, and also based on in negotiation with the organizations that it's looking to engage around how they would like to um, provide the services that that team is looking for. So I hope that's clear enough about the process, at least, even if it isn't um, definitive on what sort of restrictions exactly. Um, there obviously are restrictions from a state policy and procurement that we need to adhere to. Uh, but a lot of what will determine what actually the funding in any uh, contract is used for will be based upon the, the needs and the scope of work that's developed um, using what we call a task work order, which is basically an order, uh, uh, a, a way of describing what the what tasks are needed around what timeline and how much funding for what types of activities, um, what deliverables are, are uh, asked for around what and, and on what timeline, et cetera. So it's going to be, we're looking to make that very simple um, and very clear. Uh, so that, that will, there'll, there'll be hopefully no, <laughs> no lack of clarity on that. I would like to address, I'm sorry for mispronouncing it, Eon, Eon Simonotti's comment um, here. Can a mission driven for profit company apply to this RQL? Yes, yes, you may. That is um, explicitly stated in the RQL. You can be for profit and definitely mission driven, and all the other criteria would have to apply as well, but yes. So there's a question. The next question I see here is from Jenna Lawson around subcontractors and um, a question just around allowable use of budget for subcontractor overhead. Um, I'm not familiar enough uh, on the two percent, um, Lisa. If you could, yeah, I could, go ahead. Sorry, um, Michael, I actually would like Laura to um, try to respond. So we, we, we can come, maybe we'll come back to that if Laura. Okay. Um, oh, yeah, Laura, speak. it's Laura. I'm sorry. It's on the 1 note stock. Um, you know, then, but the, the point about, um. Budget allowed for, for overhead, et cetera, uh, for when I'm only up to 30%. Of the budget is allowed for uh, allocating to subcontractors, and I, that thirty percent is if you bring them in after you're already accepted into the pool. I believe it's it maybe higher. I think we see you mentioned it was higher if you come in the pool um, with them named. Um, it asks about allowable subcontractor item lines other than overhead staff time. So again, with with, um, with all of this. Uh, it will be done on the task work order basis. Uh, the what in terms of what is allowable, um, or what what sort of support and services are being requested. Um, they'll it'll be very uh, it will be made explicit in those task task work orders. Um, and but yeah, I think this is an opportunity for those that are in the pool to, um, you know, provide further. You know, information if they believe we need to make something clear. Once those are that are selected into the pool. And we'll try yeah. to provide more cl more clarity on that in the follow up Q and a. Yeah, the 2% issue. I mean. Yeah. Um. I see there's a question here from um, Haley, Haley Delisle. Are, are you looking for CBOs engaged in energy sustainability, sustainability field already or non sustainability groups? Not quite sure um, Haley, but we, we're definitely looking for you. You don't have to already be in the energy. You have to have some experience, right? You have to have experience in an energy related uh, field um, and want to have meaningful engagement when I start a. So I, I would just encourage you to um, 
read the solicitation more closely, uh, but I, I want to say, yeah, we're looking for CBOs engage obviously in energy, um, but I'm just not quite sure what you mean of non sustainability groups. So, again, just please reference the RQL. If it's not clear, feel free to follow up with an email or a phone call. Happy to clarify that further. I would like to respond to Ms. Daphne Sanchez's comment here regarding rates. Should we provide rates with escalation? Considering this is a four, yes, yes, thank you, Daphne. That is also in the um, uh, in the solicitation, and we do request that you include escalation rates. Uh, and there is a, a cap percentage. So, um, give I me believe it's three percent. Yeah, I think you're right. Max three percent per year. There's a question here, Margot Cargill, um, on compliance and enforcement measures. What will what compliance and enforcement measures will be in place? Um, I, I th that will be made that that will all be included in the umbrella agreements with those that are selected in the pool. So all that again will be um, made very clear. Our, our intention here is to make this as easy and simple as possible to work with us. Um, we're, you know looking to adjust where needed so that that's possible. We're trying to make everything from this application as clear. Um, and we want to make sure we get, you know, representative groups in here, but in terms of the work, we want to make the bar fairly low to. To be responsive to the needs and, and clear in the task work orders about what what's being asked and. Um, we, we're anticipating a lot of hopefully a lot of activity coming through this. Um. And again, we want to make this really easy to administer. Um, so, so it, um, you know, we, we're going to, we're going to put, I would say a bias on. Action and engagement versus bureaucracy and administration. Obviously we have certain parameters, you know, being a state agency. Procurement policies we need to stick to, but. We're, we're trying to stretch those as far as we can. I see, a, I see a question here from um, Tamsin Newberg um, saying uh, we're an environment, local environmental group engaged in fighting methane infrastructure, among other issues, would we qualify as an energy related group? Uh, yes, so um, I would say the emphasis in this RFQL is principally on whether you are representative of and serving uh, disadvantaged communities, obviously, methane infrastructure is an, methane is an energy <laughs> source, so it absolutely is a, an energy issue. Um, but 1st, and foremost, we've ordered those in priority, like, you know, the, uh, what types of organizations at the end of the day, we're looking to ensure that we are. Bringing the voices of, uh, frontline historically marginalized communities. Um, we're compensating them for their time so they can participate so they can build their capacity to work with us. And whether or not that your organization is very active in energy is, um, is, I would say, less a priority than whether or not you are representative of and serving that community, meeting a variety of different needs. Uh, we're most interested in ensuring that voice is brought to the table and working with organiza community based organizations that can bring that voice to the table. Um, if you're, uh, you know, you have some interest in some background in specific energy issues. That's uh, helpful, but it's I wouldn't say it's uh, necessarily, you know, a requirement. Um, it's a it's a helpful thing for sure, but it's I don't want to discourage organizations that maybe are looking to get more into energy, and have a lot of great work in in a particular community and want to help that community understand and and better um, ensure that their needs are met through the energy policies and, and programs that we're developing, then we absolutely are interested in those kinds of organizations um, as well.
Okay, we are at time um, and I don't, are there any other questions that we can address? Um, and if not, if we can go to the next slide, please. So we just wanted to uh, take a brief for next steps and closing. Next slide, please. So a recording of this uh, informational webinar will be made available as soon as we can um, uh, get it ready for posting. So look for that. It'll also be this will be posted on our on our website along with uh, all the funding opportunity attached documents to RFQL. Um, again, please submit your proposal using the apply, on, apply online link, which will take you to the login. Proposals are due again September 12. So take advantage of this additional time, please. Note three o'clock, it will close. So again, do not wait until the last minute. I encourage you to go ahead and start and you know and logging into the portal now so that if you experience any issues in advance, we can troubleshoot that. We encourage you to have other organizations in your network. Um, you know, spread the word. We really are trying to get a good response here. Um, and then finally, NYSERDA will select the final CBOs in uh, in the stakeholder services pool according to the timeline, the milestone timeline that we're anticipating for November. Um, I wanna thank everyone for your time and, and all your wonderful questions and apologies if we didn't get to all of them. We will, again, we will follow up with the frequently asked questions on the solicitation page. Continue to use our public engagement inbox. The feedback doesn't stop here, right? So um, again, I just wanna thank you all so much for your interest, for your time. Um, we wish you a good afternoon and um, um, yeah, thank you. Thank you for joining us today. Yes, that will conclude our presentation. Thank you all.